G'day world, Chris Hogan coming to you for episode 119 of the Proactive Podcast. And I'm here today with James Bartle, the founder of Outland Denim, uh, a brand that's 100% built on purpose. Welcome, James. Yeah, cheers, Chris. Welcome to the Proactive Podcast, brought to you by Me Media. Thanks so much for joining us, mate. Just uh, come a little bit closer to that mic. Mate, um, I'm just going to read a little bit of an update on or bio on uh, on Outland Denim because uh, some of you may not know who they are. And it was founded in 2011 and provo- to provide opportunity to women to have who have experienced exploitation. Uh, Outland Denim invests in underprivileged communities through employment. Today, the brand welcomes employees from varying backgrounds of vulnerability and social injustice, offering training, living wages, and educational opportunities, as well as leading in sustainable fabric practices and water usage. 750 people so far have benefited from the stable employment with Outland Denim in Cambodia. Uh, Mate, congratulations are in order. Uh, Cheers, man. Mate, because in May 2020, (laughs) mid-pandemic, mid-GFC 2.0, basically we... uh, we saw you close out an equity crowdfunding campaign raising $1.3 million. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't a good time to be doing it, was it? Mate, it, 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 you wouldn't say so, but I think your target, what, what was your target? Yeah, well, look, we, we put a target. If we could get over 500K, because we were, you know, right in the midst of a pandemic, we thought we'd be doing well. And um, we hit that um, uh, really quickly, actually. We were the fastest company that the platform had ever had to hit their minimum target. So... You know, it just proves, I think, that there's an appetite for, um, you know, business that's built on purpose. 100%. And, mate, music to my ears. Uh, That's what Proactive is all about, is building brands on purpose. And, mate, you you call yourself the people's brand. Tell me a bit more about that. Yeah, look, I mean, I've always dreamed of being able to have a brand that um, could benefit as many people from the beginning to the end. And I think when we talk about things like brands built on purpose or proactive brands or businesses, you know, we often think about um, the immediate need that the business or brand exists to help. And for us, that's vulnerable women um, in, in situations where they've been exploited. Um, and it's our job to be able to give these these opportunities to sort of give them a, a much uh, more stable future. And then also the environmental side. But we forget often about then the next part. And that's where, you know, all the other stakeholders come into our brand. That's the media who talk about it. It's the retailers who sell it, the sales associate on the sales floor who sells it and whose family rely upon those sales. And so for us, it was it just made absolute sense to be able to raise equity in this way where we could offer it back to the community, the people who genuinely want to see the change that, that we exist to um, create within the fashion industry. So um, that's the reason we call ourselves a people's brand is we believe that every everyone from the very beginning, that person who plants that seed in the ground to the very end person who buys and wears the product needs to benefit from this. And if we can't create that, well then really we're, we haven't created a, a model that's um, got this, this impact from beginning to end that we dreamed of. Awesome, mate. Um, and so I often say that the, the, the ultimate uh, brand goal is to have an emotional connection with your consumer. Uh, are, are you seeing people, you know, that buy once, uh, come back and buy again and again, and that they, that they do have an emotional connection with Outland Denim? Well, you're one of them. Yeah. I mean, I, mean <laughs> I, I, I look up your profile and, and you've bought a few pairs of jeans off us. And so absolutely, there's, yeah. there's absolutely no question that when people go, look, I'm buying a product that um, is worth its, its, um, its price because of the quality and, and the lifestyle that the brand represents. But then also, um, I know that I'm helping create a much better future as a result of purchasing this product. I mean, that's that's a no-brainer for most people today. And, you know, the, the the cherry on top is when they open up the product and they read on the inside of one of the pockets a, a little thank you note written by one of the seamstresses. And, you know, usually that's um, a pretty powerful tool to engage um, our customers uh, with the lives of those that are the ones that are producing their products. Mm. Mate, most businesses, all businesses, should be solving, you know, a problem worth solving you know not not another coffee app you know not another <clears throat> you know way to um i guess uh save money um uh, every time you you purchase a coffee would you know yeah saving money is important but there's plenty of there's plenty of crap ideas out there and solving a problem worth solving 
I, I think you, you are definitely doing that. And, and I, I think the, the challenge that most businesses have when they're trying to establish their purpose and, and, and how their business is going to operate and, and why they exist, they don't have a problem big enough that that's worth solving. I mean, and you've sort of taken it like to a world level where you're trying to solve one, um, human trafficking, so anti-human trafficking. I mean, that was the original reason why you started the business, wasn't Absolutely, it? Absolutely, yeah. 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 And uh, coincidentally, uh, Taken was on TV last night. Uh, and, and yeah, mate, it's a, it's a shocking, shocking industry that, that you know, I suppose you can call it an industry. It is. It's an industry. Yeah, it's yeah. worth 150 billion dollars. Like it's a it's a full blown, massive, profitable industry. Yeah, and and so and denim jeans. How much? What's the value of that industry? Um, 66 billion, I think, something like that. Yeah, yeah, it's huge. I mean, but it's it's nothing in comparison to human trafficking. Yeah. And um, but fashion, fashion's in the trillions, and it's it's a uh, it's a monster of a of a thing. It's you know one of the the worst exploiters of all industries and um, of people and planet. And so it's also the ultimate industry to be able to challenge some of these massive wrongs that we see as normal today. So whether that be human exploitation of whatever kind or environmental degradation. And um, the exciting part is that we're in a time in history where we can address these issues and the community is gonna get behind it and back it. And in fact, it's become a, a very popular thing to do is to be seen to be supporting these kinds of initiatives. Um, so we don't want anyone to have to sacrifice and make a donation. Actually, what we want people to do is just buy products that treat the people and the planet in the way that they deserve to be treated. And if we could do that, then w the future is absolutely bright. The future is full of solving problems and the fashion industry is the perfect place to start. Yeah, right. I mean, that's that's shocking that, you know, the fashion industry is one of the worst offenders. Uh, are, you t are you talking things like sweatshops and, and um, I mean, slavery and- Yeah, man, slavery, like, um, you know, one of one of our staff members, you know, 17 year old girl um, taken as a 14 year old with her friend um, into Malaysia and held as a literal hostage there as a slave making clothing. Um, her friend died while there because unfortunately today it's cheaper to replace a slave than to look after them. Um, until eventually she was rescued by an incredible NGO, um, which is where we came into contact with her and were able to give her the next step and employment and opportunity beyond what she had faced in her past. Um, that's unfortunately a very common story. And to us, that sounds like, my gosh, like let's get the rice that thing and write a movie. Um, but that's so many millions of people around the world. In fact, you know, the um, the rate of slavery today is, is much higher, it's, it's growing, it's not getting smaller. Um, but again, I keep coming back to the fact that I think we're at a very unique time in history that's gonna be marked by a time when industry stepped up and went, no, no more. And we see that happening in places like Australia with the government saying, uh, introducing the Modern Slavery Act. And that's a first step. It's not the end goal, but it's a first step in being able to hold companies to account um, for the way that they operate, the practices that they introduce into their company culture. And, um, and today, we're seeing companies having to completely rethink the way they operate. And the, the funny thing is that most humans don't exist to be bad. We don't want to be. But unfortunately, we're all part of the problem. I'm part of the problem too. And so that's what's exciting is that now we can innovate and create and come up with new businesses that address these issues. And you started before talking about the idea that, you know, so, um, it's hard for brands to find the purpose or businesses to find the purpose, their why. Um, and we've addressed one which is a big one, but it's also our superpower. If we weren't addressing uh, an issue as, uh, as big as this or an issue that needs a solution as much as this, I would have quit a long time ago. But I can't quit because I think about those people and I go, the future could be very different for them if only we could create something that changed uh, the opportunities they have to be able to be prosperous on their own. And if that could be, become a, a globally recognized um, movement or business model. So not just our business, but if other businesses adopt this kind of model, then man, the sky is literally the limit. You could do anything. You could change the world. You could end poverty. 
through business. 100%, James. And, and, and that comes from, I believe, the 1960s sentiment is in, in total rebirth. It's a nostalgic sentiment that's come back. It's an anti-establishment uh, se- sentiment saying that basically we're not going to wait for governments to actually make these changes. Glad our, you know, glad governments are making changes. But people are fed up waiting. And, and so that, that nostalgic sentiment is power to the people. And I actually heard it said uh, just a couple of days ago and, and I, I've been writing about it in my book and I was like a bit taken back. The first time I've heard it publicly said at a rally and, and that, you know, that's it. We've had enough. We're taking it back. And we're voting with our wallets. Yeah. And, and I've voted with my wallet when I've purchased Outland Denim because basically I've said to myself, listen, if I'm going to purchase denim jeans, which I am, you can tell I love it. You know, yeah. <laughs> I wear it as a uniform. It basically, how can I justify spending money with another brand that doesn't have a purpose or doesn't have a cause as strong as yours. And, uh, and it's the reason why you guys exist. So mate, I'm, I'm properly, you know, stoked to have you here and, uh, and my hat goes off to you because you can see the passion that, that lives within, within you and within your team, all because you guys are basically have the same value set and, and, and are driven by that same purpose. What are some of the other things like you, you've mentioned, you know, so for environmental, that that come into the business or that you found that that make up the i guess the negative parts of the fashion industry that you are also trying to change within your business well look to be perfectly honest chris when i started i did not care about the environmental issues and in fact if you had tried to talk to me about it i would have thought you're a tree hugging hippie and i would have moved on very quickly but um during this journey and and really wanting to help the people i discovered that um, the environmental degradation on communities where our products are made, in particular in the, in the poorer communities, um, like where we work in Cambodia, they're absolutely exploited. Um, they're, they're, their ecosystems are exploited to industry. Um, Is and that things like dyes running into Yeah, it? Yeah, man, like go and, go and Google, um, you know, blue dogs of India. You know, you'll see these dogs that are um, swimming in the river coming out indigo blue because of the dyes running down the, the waterways. And, you know, I could go into many stories that directly impact the people we employ as a result of those kinds of behaviours um, from within our industry. And so those dyes that they're using, they're, they're also... They're toxic. Toxic, yeah. absolutely toxic. Even plant-based dyes can be can be toxic. You know, so um, we decided that we needed to address this. We couldn't say we care about the people if we didn't the planet. And it was at that point that I realised that you know they are one and the same. You know, if we're going to talk about addressing this issue with slavery, we need to address this issue of environmental degradation. And in fact, you know, very interestingly, you could um, claim actually that um, based off some studies that a man named Kevin Bales has done that. Um, one of the biggest contributing industries to environmental degradation is actually slavery. And so if we really want to solve some of these environmental issues that we face today, um, we first need to address the people. If we address the people, if we help them and we get them out of this hand to mouth and get them into a position where they have the ability to be able to be educated and think and dream about the future and what they want it to be like, then we can make a change on the environment. Mm. They can't be done separately. They have to be done together. And so it was on this journey that, that we learned these things and started to adopt different technologies. And so we started to look for, well, how do you address these problems and what actually are they? And we discovered that there's incredible technology that's out there. And if you could take a little bit of this and a little bit of that and you put it together, you've got something that really changes the dynamic of producing a gene and the impact of producing a gene. Um, genes are the worst product in fashion for the disaster that it creates, you know, on an environmental level. So we, it's the dyeing, it's the amount of water that's used in producing the fibres, um, all the way through to the washing and finishing processes. We all want a gene that looks like it's been worn for 30 years. Um, well, to get that, you've got to use really harsh bleaches and chemicals, pumice stone, so stone washing, and all of these things together, you know, create a pretty, um, pretty hideous. Um, outcome. And so we knew that that had to change. We introduced laser technologies, eFlow and ozone technologies. Um, the laser doesn't even use water, it just uses a laser beam to literally laser on those little stonewash highlights. Um, 
eFlow technology uses nanobubbles. Instead of submerging in thousands of liters of chemical and water, it mists these nanobubbles over fabric and gets the same, same results. And then ozone, it doesn't use any of the harsh bleaches and is able to get that bleaching result. So, you know, by just those things, you've completely changed the impact of a product. But again, we're not perfect. You know, we've still got a long way to go, but when people buy our product, we innovate. We use it to find new ways and continue researching. I mean, we've done everything with partnering with universities to grow mushrooms on textile waste, to try and consume it and solve some of those issues. We're consistently working on these things. And that's why I think that the future for fashion is really exciting because I actually believe that the answer to these problems is consumerism. I don't think the answer to environmental degradation is slow fashion. And that's what you hear out there in the marketplace. But that's thinking about the environment only, not thinking about the people. And like I said, until we combine them, we'll never solve the issue. But what if we could create products where the outcome was that the people on the planet were in a better position after being created than they were before? And I believe that's possible because Richard Branson was um, clever enough to build a rocket that could fly to the moon. That sounds way harder to me than solving some of these issues. So I just think all we need is the resource to be able to invest into it. And that's why we created our brand. That's why people buy our product. And, and with those things together, with the support of the, the community and, and the resource, we can actually find solutions to these things like we've already found so far. Yeah, mate, <laughs> rock on. Um, so, mate, you, you actually founded here in the Gold Coast hinterland it's on Tambourine Mountain. Um, and, mate, you were just saying to me that Australians aren't really, like, buying denim as much as you would have thought and that your, your biggest markets are actually overseas. And uh, specifically the Gold Coast aren't backing Outland Denim anywhere near as much as you should. Guys, come on. Um, you know, homegrown hero right here and uh, absolutely we should be getting on board and you do have a stockists, you've just released stock, uh, stockists listing or a feature on your website so yeah. people can actually find where you're stocked. That's all right. And uh, I'm happy to say my good friends at Western James in James Street of Burley Heads are the only Gold Coast stockists. Yeah. And uh, so get down there and try that, those garments on if uh, you are a bit hesitant about sizing and all that sort of stuff. And uh, once you've done that, then you can buy a truckload online for sure. So uh, that, just, that just came out in June. And um, mate, you, you've also introduced an Outland Denim Medical Clinic. W what's that all about? Well, I guess it's, um, it's consistently looking at how we can, or what are the needs first? What are the needs of our staff in Cambodia where we have our two facilities? And, um, you know, medical um, treatment and care is something that is hard to come by and it's hard to come by good care. And so we introduced a, um, a, a little clinic and um, that was before COVID, then COVID hit. And it was just so vital to us to be able to keep our staff as safe as possible during this time. And because we had nurses on site that would be able to do training and, um, and hygiene and then how to follow up and um, look at any of the health, ne health needs that any of our staff had. But the beauty is it can go beyond our staff and go into their families. And the educational process, which is one of the most powerful things, when you educate people around health needs and healthcare, um, and then that goes back into their families and into their communities. And we've been collecting data, tracking, what actually happens when you educate somebody? Where does it start and where does it stop? And, and it, doesn't, it stop, doesn't stop, it continues on. So if you can put really good sound educational opportunities in front of people, then the impact is gonna be generational. Um, the world can change through that alone. And so this uh, medical clinic is, is a big part of seeing the need um, on, a, on a range of levels and then introducing it. Um, we've had a lot of support to do that as well. Um, we had the Australian government support to introduce those things. You know, um, you know, we go back to community again here in Australia. I mean, we've had a lot of Australian support by buying our product. Um, and um, actually, I, I do need to correct you, Australia has actually become our biggest region. Oh, um, look at Our that. biggest sales. And so that that is something that has changed. Um, we started in Canada, that, that was bigger than Australia. But I think Australia takes a little while to adopt these things. We wanna see if you're for real. And, you know, are you legit about what you're doing? Um, but when we see that you are, 
um, we're right behind you. And, yeah, and that's what we're experiencing now. And you, you mentioned um, uh, James and West um, in Burley. West the, and James. West yeah. and James, sorry, <laughs> uh, in Burley. And, um, you know, it's great little retailers like that that give us the ability to do these kinds of things because they tick away selling that product day after day. And so I always say to people, go to them and buy the product. You know, you can buy it online for sure, but if you can support a local retailer, especially now when small business is hurting, go down there and buy product from those those guys. And, um, you know, you're, you're furthering the impact of what you can have just by buying an Outland Dedham product. 100%. Uh, I think um, there's another... Uh, reason to congratulate you as well. In, in July, mate, you became a, a father yet again. Yeah. Round two, three. 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 I, got a, out, I got a third. Mate, yeah. Suck for punishment. Yeah. <laughs> um, I've got three as well. And uh, baby Jack. Yeah, baby Jack. So uh, two girls before yeah, that. Yeah, that's right. I got a boy. <laughs> and, we, and we were totally done, to be honest. Um, you know, my wife told me we weren't having any more. And then uh, all of a sudden, hey, it just uh, we got this little guy. Mate, congratulations, <laughs> congratulations to, you. to you and Erica, um, mate, and the whole Bartle family. And uh, what what else have we got here? Some notes. Uh, joined a group of Australian business businesses, industry groups, and civil society organisations to urge the federal government to remain focused on the need for sustainable future. What's that about? Well, I mean, it's it's again, it's um, you mentioned earlier about you know um, the people. Um, taking the responsibility back to get something done. We want to see a different future. We've got to take it on ourselves. There is also this um, petitioning of the government and petitioning of other bodies to be able to um, use the power and the resource they have available to create the change we want to see. Um, so that's part of it. But I'm actually a really strong believer in if you see a need, it's not anyone else's responsibility but yours to fill it. Mm. And, and again, I think that's what's exciting about now is people are going, oh, I'm not going to wait for the government. Because, you know, the reality is the government isn't set up to be able to solve the social needs of our community. That's the reality. It's actually, it's actually the, the people within community that are set up to solve those social needs in community. And so we are in a time right now where people are stepping up and going, yep, it's my responsibility and I'm going to do something about it. And we see the change. Um, it is happening. It's happening rapidly. So if you are a business that isn't engaged in this movement, because that's what it is, it's a, it's a movement, you will lose. Um, no longer are we interested in being manipulated. We don't care about greenwashing. We want real genuine impact and we will back and support real genuine businesses and brands that are there to solve a problem. 100%. Music to my ears. You nearly uh, did my sales pitch for me. Oh, sorry, man. <laughs> no, cut that bit out. Don't, yeah. no, don't cut that out. It's better when someone else says it. But, um, and and oh, I forgot my train of thought. <clears throat> oh, so uh, a lot of people would say that, you know, running a business will uh, just go out there and, and start a business. I, I, I've heard that been said. Like if you're humming and hiring about starting a business, just get out there and do it. Uh, I think there's a, I don't know the stats, but there's a massive amount of failure in, in, in small business. And and what were some of the lessons that I guess you learnt early in the piece that that you wish that y you wouldn't have to go through again if, if you if you started again? You know, I, I don't think there's, there's much that I'd say I wish I didn't go through. It's actually the failures that um, have created uh, the ability to weather the storm. And, and I don't think I'm at the place where I can weather any storm by any stretch of the imagination. But man, I, I, I think about the things that are even the most embarrassing things to me, or the biggest mistakes I've made, or what a total tool I was at Come the time. Come on, and, tell us, oh, tell us mate. one, mate. Oh, tell man, us one. If we start, we won't, <laughs> won't be able to stop, but you know. Um, you know, it's it's um, going out there arrogantly and thinking you've got an answer and getting frustrated with humanity um, in the, that no one cares, yet you've got a community full of people who care. And and it was just and it's those stupid moments that you look back on and you go you you get you know get all flushed. It's like oh my gosh, I said that and I said it publicly. Um, you know, but those things make you because you don't want to do it twice. So. My advice to anyone starting a business is, well, one, you said it already. What's the, what's the problem you're solving? If you're not solving a problem, I, I don't think there's room for you. That's, that's hard, but I think that's the truth. You need to solve a problem. Um, but if you are and you think that success looks a certain way, I, I think you should relook at it because we're just on that road to 
whatever success really looks like and failures are the only way we get there. It doesn't get there just by success after success. Yeah, I have a, I have a list and it all starts with P. Basically, we're gonna solve a problem. Yeah. Uh, it's people, planet, they don't have to be mutually exclusive uh, and, and profit. Yeah, absolutely. We, we cannot be altruistic businesses Mate, you, you, have you seen one of our pitch decks? You have, haven't you? No. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't know. We, there's five of them though, mate. You missed one. Oh, <laughs> what, what's the fear? So we got, we got people, planet, profit, purpose, and product. I think I was going to say- Product. Product, right. Yeah. Maybe I didn't say purpose. No, you uh, did. You did. Okay, okay, right. Just <laughs> move on, move on, move on. Come on. Mate, um, so where's the- Where's the brand going at the moment? You know, you've you, you got 1.3 million in the bank um, from crowdfunding, and uh, like, how much does that actually scare you? Because you know, you, you don't want to you don't want to go and blow it. You know, <laughs> you don't want to blow it. So you've got to really manage the projects that you're working on, and you've got to manage the the investor expectations and and reporting back to the investors. Uh, you're not a public company, so you don't have to tell everybody what you're doing. Uh, but I have really loved the investor reports that have been coming out and uh, and also the the cake platform. I think, you know, that's been fantastic. Uh, well done, Jason. Um, so where, where's, can you can you lead us into maybe some of the things that we can expect over the, the coming months? Yeah, for sure. I mean, look, we've been working really hard to launch a few new things. Um, one of them was when COVID hit, we fast hit fast forward to um, go to a sort of, I guess, a, a goal we had for a little further down the road, which was to manufacture for other companies. So we, we hit the green light on that and we did our first manufacturing contract. Um, we delivered on time, we de delivered a high quality. That was a massive milestone for us. We'd done a collaboration before producing product for another brand, but never production where our name wasn't in it. This was the first time. So that was massive and we have inquiry every day. I'm so particular about what brands I'll make for. Um, we also ha are launching a blank t-shirt program. So we want any new brand or any sporting club or any, any group to be able to buy t-shirts um, that are blank, that you can brand up with all your own stuff, but they come with a, a maker standard, which is the Outland Denim standard. It's the social, environmental, and economic standards that we operate to in that T-shirt. Um, and there's there's so much exciting development around the technology that's um, integrated into the T-shirt to be able to offer transparency and insight by customers, um, which is given to the brand. So it's very, can be brand and product centric, um, that advertising or that marketing that the brand can do then, um, as well as expand our collection. So there's gonna be a lot more that's gonna be coming to the market. Um, keep our eyes on our website, November, December, because we're gonna be dropping new product. We're gonna be dropping much more regularly. We were doing two seasons a year. We're now going to buy monthly. Um, and there's, there's a lot of reasons for that, but we've rejigged our entire business and we've looked at it and gone, how do we um, maximize our impact? And part of the impact, like you said, is profit. We need to generate a profit. I now have over 1,000 investors and yeah, that, that's heavy. Um, it's probably the thing I'm most scared of um, is, is failing with a thousand people. I say to my wife, oh my gosh, where would we live? Um, I go to the service station and a random person walks up to me and goes, oh, James, I invested in your company. It's like, oh man, <laughs> like, they're, they're everywhere, you know? Um, and so I've got all these new bosses and um, therefore I have to report more. So, you know, lifting our game in that, in that space, you know, we've got an amazing advisory board that we had our first meeting, uh, you know, just not so long ago, which, you know, we've got some, some really high profile players in there that are really changing um, the scope of what's possible for us as a business. So we certainly uh, have a long way to go. There's some tough, tough um, days ahead, I reckon, for us to be able to, um, you know, hit some of the, the goals that we've got. But all comes back to product. If we can produce beautiful product that matches our story, then we'll be able to um, have uh, an impact that I believe goes well beyond um, what we've ever imagined. Unreal, unreal. Well, mate, that's a perfect segue to, to basically uh, wrap up, I think. And how do people stay across what outland denim, sorry, what outland denim is up to and, and what James Bartle's up to? Where's the best places to, to follow? Yeah, just follow our Instagram and, um, you know, sign up for our newsletter. Uh, that's the, that's probably the, the best place. And, um, you know, we're, we're, 
really keen to engage the community in what we're doing. We we really do genuinely believe that this is a brand that was for the people. Um, this isn't about um, you know a few fat cats at the top getting rich. This is about creating that lasting impact, and I believe that's going to happen as we engage our community. So we want you to come on the journey with us, and you know we want your feedback. Talk to us. Um, try our product. Um, it's risk free. Try our product. Buy it. Order it. Um, we'll pay for the shipping there and back if you don't like it. Full refund. Um, we just want people in this product. This is this is life changing product, and um, we're stoked for the support and thank you to the community for for backing us so far. Hundred percent. And like you said before, support your local. If you do have a local retailer in your area, hundred percent, give them the support. Uh, that's also supporting the people as well and supporting jobs and uh, su supporting the economy. So thanks so much, James. Chris, thank you, man. Yeah, thanks for watching, guys. That's another episode of the Proactive Podcast that's building brands on purpose. Uh, you can check us out on at memedia.com.au. Uh, there's plenty more episodes there. Otherwise, we're on Apple and Spotify. Cheers.